How's it, everybody? Real quick announcement before we start the show. Jimmy and I are partnering up with Wizards of the Coast over the coming months to bring you a series of Command Zone live events. That's right. We're going to be streaming some episodes live to you, which means that if you're in the audience watching it and you're in the chat, you'll be able to interact with us in real time and join the discussion. The first episode will be on March 29th and we'll be discussing the worst mistakes commander players make. I know all of us make some of these mistakes, so you're definitely not going to want to miss it. Uh, if you want to check it out, make sure you go down into the show notes. There will be a link with more info on how you can attend. So definitely looking forward to it myself. Hope to see you there. Make sure you tune in again on March 29th. All right, on to our regular podcast episode. Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I can see all the obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's gonna be a bright, 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 bright sunshiny day. It's, it's gonna, gonna be, be a bright, 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 bright sunshiny, sunshiny day. Yeah. We started so low and I, slow. We, and very slow, It was yeah. like when you start happy birthday and you're like, oh crap, this is gonna take forever because of the cadence we've set. Every time I start singing happy birthday, I worry I'm gonna forget the person's name. <laughs> <laughs> so I still go happy birthday and everyone keeps going, I'm like, Roger, Roger, Roger. <laughs> or Roger. when they have like a nickname and everybody looks around like, which name are we yeah. using? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Or if they have a very long name, then oh, yeah. how are you gonna how are you gonna slap it on there? Right, Who knows? Right, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's up, everyone? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm one your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. So, um, we've got a cool topic today. Let's imagine you've discovered you enjoy Commander. Welcome to the club, everybody. One of the most common questions we get here at the Command Zone is, what is the best way to get into the format? Yeah, how to get started? Yeah, we've got a bunch of videos on like how to deck build and things like that, but this is not what this episode's about. It's really about, like, once you've decided you want to play Commander, what are the best sort of first steps to take to, you know, to get you so that you're a Commander player, you're actually playing games and stuff uh, in an efficient and sort of well-planned out manner. It's a very overwhelming format, too. When, oh, they, yeah. when we tell people how to teach people to play Magic, we usually recommend not starting with Commander, but now that it's the most popular format, a lot of people are entering this way. So this is a guide to help you or a friend or someone else that you might be interested in getting into the format get in. But first, we got to talk about our sponsors channelfireball.com slash command. That is the affiliate link you want to use when buying any magic products, singles, anything at all. If you're getting started in the format, we're going to talk about that actually in this episode about sort of the best way to go about building your first decks mm -hmm. and building your collections and things like that. And buying singles is really one of the best ways to do that. And the Channel Fireball Marketplace is the best place to buy singles. They have a ton of vendors on their site. They are competing with each other, vying for your business, driving prices down. They are all licensed businesses because Channel Fireball requires that mm -hmm. to even sell on their site. So that means you're going to have a good service experience. They're going to get you stuff fast. It's not just some random person selling out of their basement. It is a <laughs> business that, it, you know, has customer service and will be able to um, help you out if there's troubleshooting or anything involved. Mm -hmm. And I, I've ordered a lot of cards off the marketplace now and had good experiences every time. Yeah. And you don't need to be afraid of also getting fraudulent or not real stuff mm -hmm. or repacked packs. There's lots of different ways that you can order incorrectly. And so ordering from marketplace from real local game stores is a great way to ensure you get the product you need. Yeah, for sure. And I, I was just going to agree with you. Okay, cool, cool. cool. <laughs> well, when you get that product, now, if you're a new player, you don't have to do this, but we highly recommend it. That's leaving up your cards, putting them into protective deck boxes so that you can travel with them, bring them to your local game night. And to do that, we thank our other sponsor, Ultra Pro. Ultra Pro makes every single product you need to get your commander deck sleeved up, protected, your collection in binders, whether it's on the play mat or inside a nine page binder or a 12 page binder. There are so many different ways to protect your cards now and Ultra Pro has you covered on all the bases, not just that, but if you want something more than just a fancy sort of sleeve, you can get one with art on it. You can get play mats that are playing or with art on it. There's so many different options, all thanks to Ultra Pro being top of the game for many, many decades now. Yeah, Commander really is the format that best allows you to express yourself and your personality and mm -hmm. Ultra Pro helps you out with that even more by allowing you to have your sleeves, your playmat, your deck box, everything sort of themed and styled to your liking. Oh, yeah. 
And of course, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. We've got all kinds of cool perks and rewards going on over there. Um, you get to be in our Discord. Jimmy and I are on there chatting with patrons every single day. You get to watch extra turns and game nights earlier than the general public. And also, we shout out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated, dedicated to, to David Urias. Urias. David you rock. You certainly do. All right, how to get into this commander format. Commander is intimidating. We sure. don't deny it. There are so many cards, 20,000 plus cards. I think we're moving towards 30 now. I think we're oh past boy. 20. It's crazy. Okay, yeah. There's 80,000 cards you can play. <laughs> 150,000 cards. Variations at the very least. <laughs> the meta for what commander is is not clearly defined because it varies from play group to play group. Even you can go from table to table and it can be completely different in the same game store. Yeah, it's true because if you're going to get into modern or standard, there's usually like like five to eight decks that mm -hmm. are kind of the decks and it's a lot easier to get into those formats in some respects because you can at least choose one of those and you know you're kind of in there. Right. Commanders doesn't work that way. There are thousands of viable decks. Yeah, and thousands of ways to build those decks and at different power levels and all that. So it's obviously overwhelming and there's not one sort of simple guide to jump in. So we're going to provide that for you today. I'm going to give you some tips on how you can continue and begin your commander journey all the way from also just collecting the cards themselves, how to get them and the ways to do it in a way that's actually, you know, smart because we've all made our mistakes and we're here to make sure that you don't go down that same path yeah that's a, i think that's a really good point the, one way to look at this episode would maybe be like tips jimmy and i would have get, would give our our younger selves if we could travel back in time nice uh, starting in the format so uh we're gonna start with you know everyone everyone always asks about cards 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 right yeah where do i get the cards where do i start what cards should i get but before we can answer those questions we need you to ask yourselves some some questions to answer some questions and then we'll get to the cards in a second here. Mm -hmm. So the first question you kind of want to ask yourself and we're going to be addressing people that are both new to commander meaning they already played magic but they're coming into commander and mm -hmm. people that are just new to magic. Uh, we hear a lot a lot of people these days tell us like I watch game nights I've never played magic before it looks fun I'm trying to get in what do I do? Right. So we want to talk to those people. But also there's a ton of people who are like, hey, I was a standard player. I was a modern player. I played limited. Um, I played on arena. But commander looks fun. I want to get into it. What do I do? We think we can encompass all that. And we think there's even going to be some stuff here for veteran players who maybe, um, ha maybe haven't gone through all the steps or are wanting to usher or shepherd other people in the format and this might help you with that as well so yeah a sibling a friend someone that's watched you play and is like hey i want to i want to do some of that too so if you're getting into commander i think the, one of the first things you want to ask yourself is what is your play style and this might seem like it'd be hard to figure out if you haven't played commander but there's a bunch of ways you can sort of at least get an educated guess of what it might be um and, and even if you're coming from Magic, you might think, hey, I know my play style because in Modern, I play this aggro deck, right? right? Yeah, that's that doesn't really work one-to-one -one when converting over to Commander. Yeah, also, a lot of times people play a deck because it was the first deck or the cheapest deck or the one that their friend lent them, and it actually doesn't match with what they like to do. So knowing your play style is more than just what have I played the most, mm -hmm. it's what do I enjoy playing and what do I want to do when I get to Commander. And Commander's archetypes are a little bit different than the way they work in other formats. There aren't that many aggro decks, and the aggro decks don't exactly work the same way as mm -hmm. like a red burn deck would work in modern right <laughs> there really aren't any commander decks that are um you know play a lot of low drop attacky stuff and small burn and get you i'd say a combo deck in commander is more akin to a, a, an aggro deck in the other formats in that it's trying to kill you faster oh right or do something where the game just ends before they can sort of retaliate right exactly you are it, it's it is still like a combo deck in those other formats and that you're trying to assemble specific pieces but just mm -hmm. the way in that it's like hey i'm gonna try and end this thing super fast that is a mentality that combo deck has there aren't as many I'm going to try and end this thing fast by like attacking. Yeah, because it's there. also a multiplayer format. Yep. So you have three opponents typically. And so a lot of those aggro strategies just don't work out. In fact, a lot of the strategies that you find in other magic formats don't work out because you don't have four ofs. Yeah. Yeah. So it's harder to be as consistent. I would say also commander has some archetypes or uh, deck types that do not exist in other formats. So yeah, yeah, yeah. group hug is a play style that you can play in Commander, <laughs> but you can't really play a group hug deck in any other format, uh, any 1v1 format that is, I suppose. And this is a style of play that is like, I'm going to ostensibly do things that are good for everybody. I'm gonna play mm -hmm. cards that make everybody draw cards. I'm gonna play cards that give everybody creatures or do good things to the benefit of everybody or pass, you know, I'm, I'm gonna give the things I'm playing away to other people, mm -hmm. things like that. That's just not a thing 
in Legacy, you know? <laughs> no. I mean, it could be. You can do that. You're just not going to win because it's one-on-one. -on -one, right. And that's not the goal of those formats. Um, a lot of you out there also might be big into board games or TTRPGs mm. or Dungeons & Dragons players. A lot of what you do in those things are going to tell a ton about you as a player when it comes to Magic as well. So when you sort of get into the format, you can just ask yourself, what are the games I've really enjoyed playing? Even video games can give you a lot of clues as to sort of what you might enjoy as a play style. What is the kind of character you play in Elden Ring? What's the kind of oh, character yeah. you play in any... League of Legends. Of yeah, League yeah. of Legends. Yeah, that will say a lot um, because we've talked about this before. There is a sort of trend that's moving forward in games where the hero, the titular person, that champion is very similar to the legendary creature that leads your deck in Commander 2. Yeah, I would say like, it's funny, but I'm the same player in a game of Magic generally and what I like to do uh -huh. that I am in basketball or oh. that I am in StarCraft. Right. And those are three very different things, but I tend to like the same kind of things. So it's like, do you like puzzle solving? Mm -hmm. Or do you like to be proactive versus reactive? You know, I'm definitely more of a reactive player than I am a proactive player. Jimmy, I think you're a little oh, more proactive certainly. probably. Zerg Rush. Yeah. <laughs> am I, do I like the social interaction part of games? Am I trying to, you know, get social generally when I have the chance in games? Or am I not? Am I more of a, you know, pay attention to what I'm doing type of player? Those will all inform the type of play style that you are and that will help you sort of hone in on what type of deck you might want to start out with or try mm -hmm. or build because that's really why we're doing this you're not going to be able to early on build all the decks right nor should you yeah you don't want to you want to kind of figure out what might i like because you want to give your when you're getting into commander early on you want to give yourself the best chance at attaining the goal of having fun doing it mm -hmm. and the best way to figure that out for or the best first step to figuring that out is what do i generally like yeah okay let me move in that direction first yeah get some hints make sure that so for instance the first commander deck i built was in blue and black and turns out my favorite commander was blue black and red i just had to add another color to it but i wasn't sort of on the opposite side of the spectrum for the colors because i knew what my play style was and what i was going for you're grixis from the start yeah Holy well, crap, well I, I was blue black and then I was because I really liked oh, the commander right, right. and I didn't I had no idea what I was doing but I sort of liked what the colors did and I remember old cards I really liked like Vesuvian Doppelganger so I had sort of that thing going in that direction and then I was like wait a minute I'm missing a special spicy piece here the red the aggro the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I was Grixis I was Nekusar my first oh, that's right that's right yeah, yeah but yeah, that's because yeah. I like drawing cards and I was like that card cares about drawing <laughs> cards <laughs> <laughs> truly um, okay well speaking of colors once you understand your play style and what you like to do in those other games you can now start looking at what the analog is in commander and magic in general because the game is split into five primary colors and the way those colors interact with each other and what those colors represent it's kind of like the four elements in avatar the last airbender or the different sorts of you know types of champions in other games it's going to cover a broad spectrum and they're sort of going to show you denote what happens in these colors what do these colors like to do and that should be pretty easy at this point to start figuring out oh i kind of like that more than that yeah, you can look at the colors, see what they like to do and say, oh, I found out what I like to do, match that up with the colors. Maybe I'll start out with these two colors or these three colors, mm -hmm. kind of lean in those directions. So real quick, we're not going to do a full breakdown of every color because it is actually pretty deep this well. Yeah. But on the surface, white is about removal, board wipes, creating tokens, lots of creatures. We call that a go wide strategy. White also has a lot of little cheap to cast creatures. So mm -hmm. if you like having a lot of creatures, white might be for you. Yep. Uh, and by the way, if you can just flip over a magic card if you have one and you can see all the colors on the back in the nice pentagon. Uh, the next color going down the line is blue. Blue is the color of control, of, of knowledge. It's using counter spells to stop you from doing stuff. It's very tricky. It acts at instant speed, so sort of in reaction to people. And it's a, there's a lot of interaction uh, in blue. It's not as much removal, but rather it's more stuff like, all right, bounce that back to your hand, make this creature leave, and then enter the battlefield again. So things that aren't straight up, get rid of it entirely, but more, let me do something to control the tempo a little bit. I like that word tricky. Blue to me is the color that has just sort of the weirdest effects sometimes. Like, yeah. what does that do? That's, <laughs> that's weird. Why would you even want to do that? But you find reasons. Yep. Uh, black is the color that uses life as a resource, so willing to hurt itself to gain some other advantage. It's like another color of removal. It's very good at, at getting rid of specifically creatures off the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, and then Black really plays around with its own graveyard, so it uses its graveyard as a resource. It's recurring creatures from there. It likes to dump a lot of stuff in there and sort of 
say, oh, you've got 20 cards in your graveyard. Mm-hmm. That's bad for some decks, but for black, they're like, I can look through there and, and now I can pull do cards out of there and yeah. do stuff with them. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously black is the color then of zombies and the yep. sort of those darker creatures as well. Uh, whereas blue has wizards and white has angels. Those are sort of like the hero creatures of each. Uh, next is red. So red is definitely the fastest of all of the colors. It uses burn spells. It has the ability to deal direct damage to things like throwing a lightning bolt or a fireball at something. Uh, obviously a lot of removal there, but also haste, which is a very important keyword that allows your creatures to act instantly when they enter the battlefield. It also has something we call impulsive draw. So typically when you draw a card, you can wait till the next turn to play that card. But with red, it's like, hey, we're going to flip these cards off the top of your library right now and you have to use them this turn, otherwise they go away forever. So it's a bit more playing sort of with your heart in your sleeve a little bit. Everyone can kind of see what's going on, but you can still do things a lot faster than everyone else. And of course, red's more aggressive than the other colors. And yeah, it's, and it's red's an assertive color, right? Yeah. Like, it's way less going to try and stop everything you're doing and more like, nope, I'm going to try and throw punches at you. What can you do about it? Yep. And the red creature is goblins. Typically. Oh, yeah. Uh, green is the final color, and it's all about creatures, mostly. It's also good with lands. Uh, and green is really good at growth or pumping, buffing its own creatures. Ugh. Yeah. The green stuff likes to grow, as you might expect. Mm-hmm. Um, it has a keyword trample. Most green, or green has the most trample of any color, and trample is a creature that's so big that even if you block it, it's still going to trample through and hit the opponent. Um, and then... Green is also a go-wide uh, color with white, where it can make a lot of tokens and be like, well, we're going to have a lot of little things. So it doesn't matter if you have two or three blockers. We're just going to go around all that stuff and swarm you. Yeah, green's actually one of the most, sort of has a little bit of everything yeah. in terms of all the all the other colors. Uh, it's very powerful in Magic. I would say green and black are the two colors that can do the most wide array of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the green creature, I don't know, beasts, elephants, things in that world. Centaurs, maybe? Centaurs, yeah. There are more centaurs in green than other colors, that's for sure. (laughs) Oh, elves, duh. Oh, elves, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What are we even thinking about? (laughs) Jeez. Well, I can't believe we have a podcast. All right, once you... uh once you have these starter question answered, hopefully at this time you're already thinking like, okay, this is my place out, the type of play I like. These colors sound interesting or fun to me. You can help narrow down sort of what commander you might be interested in um, by going to like a website. So you're looking at legendary creatures and EDH rec is mm-hmm. kind of our favorite. It's just E D H R E C dot com. You can sort of look through what the most popular commanders by color are. So it gives you a, an easy way to just kind of scroll through and see what different commanders are even available. Mm-hmm. Uh, MTG goldfish is a good place. Yep. Reddit as, as well. There's tons of online discussion. Every time new cards come out, players will begin to talk about them. And that's a great chance for you to go in and say, Hey, wait, I, I like green. So let's start there. And then you're looking at creatures with green in it and you can see, Oh, what are players saying about this creature? Oh, people think this is super busted or people think this is really fun. This is really unique. And that can also sort of help form you'll let your opinion around what you want to do yeah and again i would as i'm looking through the legendary creatures in the colors or the color pairings or whatever that i think i might be interested in you're kind of just looking for something that jumps out of you and seems fun you're like oh that seems cool and that might you know that's a good indicator that that might be a good first commander for you to give a a, you know a try yeah all right so now you know sort of your play style what you like to do you know some colors you might identify with by the way it can be all five there's nothing wrong with that there's plenty of options there too don't lock into anything yet though yeah because you still need to ask a more questions so another thing about commander is that it's a very unique format because there's so many different ways to go about it when you're playing modern standard these formats your goals are typically i want to win i want to beat the other players but with commander it can be a much more broad scope of things that you want to do so ask yourself what are your goals both as a player in the game as a collector as a deck builder and we're going to list out some hypothetical goals of some uh, sort of imaginary players and you can see sort of what we're asking about here and maybe where you can fit in inside that box And if you're new to Commander, especially coming from limited or standard or something, it might feel weird to even ask that question. What do you mean, what are my goals? Of course, my goal is to win. I'm going to draw an analogy to basketball again. When you go to play basketball, pick up basketball for fun at a gym, Mm -hmm. most people's goal is not to win, right? Your main goal is probably get in shape, sweat. Yeah, uh, have fun. Work on my jump shot. Uh, You know, yeah, have fun. Hang out with my friends. And... 
Commander is more like that because most people playing Commander, there's not a lot of stakes. You're not playing in a tournament generally. Yeah. There, so winning, it's it's like a spectrum. Winning is one of the columns, and you're like, oh, I got like a thirty in winning, but yeah. having fun, <laughs> I've got like a seventy. And then you know, my friends having fun is also on that scale. And I would look at it in those terms. That's one of the reasons people love Commander. I think is because it really brings the fun aspect back into it, and yeah. then the fun can be tied to winning, but not a hundred percent all yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you could be the person that cares about winning, or you could be much more on the casual side. But but Commander definitely goes the whole gamut yeah and we're not here to place value judgments on what it is that your goals are right if you are like nope i only care about winning and that is fun to me that's totally fine great it's knowing that stuff that's going to be important because you're going to want to match that up with the other players you're playing with mm -hmm. you want to make sure if your goal is to win and that's what's fun for you you want to play with people that think in a similar manner because it's when the goals aren't lined up that you start to have issues where somebody's like you only care about winning and i'm trying to have fun <laughs> that's not as much fun for yeah. everybody right okay okay hypothetical so, players that are starting out maybe you are a player that says i I want to play with my friends at their weekly game night. Just want to hang out with them. Yeah, I want to join the fray every time I see uh, them going and doing this on Friday and I'm not there. I, I feel left out. I kind of want to do what they're doing too, but I don't have the cards. I just want to start playing, figure something out there. Yeah, maybe you're the player that just wants to have like one deck that you really invest a lot of time and thought into and really make into a powerhouse. You know, mm -hmm. that would maybe be somebody that's focused on winning, but not necessarily just somebody that's like, I like... I think there are different personality types in all kinds of games. And there's one that's like, I want to perfect playing this one character. And then there's me playing Street Fighter where I'm just like, I'm going to be kind of bad at all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or you might be the person that like that wants to build tons of decks and actually invest in them equally. Or just sort of be like, I want to try a little bit of everything out. I want to build a larger collection in that case. It's the person who goes to the restaurant and orders the same thing every time because they know <laughs> or, it's good. Or the person who goes to the re same restaurant just as often, but orders different things off the menu to try them. Those, yeah, yeah. There's Nobody's right or wrong, but those are different personalities for sure. Yep. Uh, there's also the person that just wants to build a giant collection. Maybe you actually don't care about playing the game so much. You'd rather just get into magic because you know that it's really fun to collect. You're a collector above everything else. And yeah, playing can be something you do on the side, but it's not your main priority. Yeah, it's a surprise to me that how um, there's a lot of people like this, right? Where getting yeah. the particular version of cards is important to them. And they're not like tuning their duck up as far as like constantly thinking about how to improve it. So uh -huh. much as like, I want to get the foil borderless showcase version of this and that's how I'm upgrading my deck. Yeah, I want my binder to look awesome when I open it up, too. Yeah. It might be to collect enough cards and build enough collection that your friends and you can build together. And I do know people who actually group their collections with multiple people so that oh, they nice. can have more options. So this is just having options to build a lot of different things. Yeah, you also see this at clubs at school or like YMCA's and all that stuff where it's like, hey, we're going to just put all our cards together. We want uh, to have a group game night. Everyone is learning for the first time. So we want to give everyone equal, equal access to the cards. And it's more about playing with your friends rather than net decking and making the most perfect deck for every occasion. Now, speaking of making the most perfect deck, there is, of course, the player that's super competitive, wants to build the top tier best deck and then, you know, go head to head in the highest level they can find the most against more powerful decks or other powerful decks. Yep. Plenty of people that do that. Um, and then maybe the, you just want to join your local game store's weekly commander nights. Maybe you you go there and you, you've been playing board games and you see all these people having so much fun playing commander. You're like, what is that? How do I get involved in that? And that of course is more than just, you know, it could be, you could actually fit into any of the categories we just talked about and have, and sort of be that person as well that wants to just play in commander nights. Yeah. And obviously we can't, list every goal a person could have from wanting to play commander and i think all goals are valid they might not even have that much to do with the game right like yeah i think a valid goal is you know i just want to meet people and make friends mm -hmm. you know one thing i learned when i moved to los angeles jimmy uh, you came from seattle right yeah. big city i came from a small town in oregon um so there was like eight thousand people in my town growing <laughs> up so when i moved to los angeles m in my brain i thought i'm gonna move here i'm gonna know i'm gonna meet and know so many more people right so many because, people are here yeah in my hometown i know most of the people there mm -hmm. And this is going to be amazing when I go to a place that has 10 million people. Like, how many people are going to know? And then I moved to Los Angeles, and I realized I wasn't meeting anybody and getting to know anybody. And because it's because in my little hometown, I would run into the same people over and over. So yeah. you would slowly get to know them. In a big place like Los Angeles, I, that didn't happen. So you would just, everybody you're seeing, you're seeing them for the first time. And you and never... Maybe the last time, yeah. And probably the last time, yeah. And so you never really break the ice and start talking to them like, hey, I've seen you here before and start... You never have anything in common. It's just, you, you're just strangers passing all the time. Yeah. And what I found was that I had to like rewire my brain slightly to try to make friends rather than just letting it happen. And I think if you're out there, that's a really healthy outlook on life. My girlfriend, one of, I always say like one of her great talents as a human being is she's really good at making friends ah, and yes. what a great skill to have in life right because <laughs> you're just constantly going to be surrounded by friends I'm, I'm i'm more of a have a few close friends yeah um 
but I think that's a, that would be a valid reason to want to learn to play Commander, right? Like, yeah, I, it's a great way to, to meet tons of new people that all have a shared common interest. Yeah, Magic in general is really good for that. So yeah. I, I think any any goal you set is valid. Obviously, we can't list every goal that's possible here. Yeah, but yeah. just knowing what that is, what do I want from this, and being honest about it will really, really help you as you sort of move forward in the format. Yeah, and also make sure that you're making the right choices or choices that are more aligned with your goals too. Um, and I do say that's really good life advice in general is like, oh, yeah. think of friendship and gaining friends as a task, as a something that you can set a goal and purposefully try to do. And as soon as you do that, it's amazing. Like your life will just be so much better because you, you, it is just like anything else. You will, you can get better at it. Yeah. Oh, you definitely can get better at it. You can get worse at it too. If you don't go out and talk to people, actually. If you don't concentrate or give it any focus. Yeah. 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 And this is not to be like, this is the extrovert channel because introverts as well, obviously have a lot of, you know, m friend making as well. It's it's just a skill that you can get better at, no, regardless of where you are in the interest or extrovert. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it has to do with extrovert, right? Because an extrovert's just going to say, I want to make friends, and this is the way I, I'm comfortable going about right, it. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. an introvert is still probably a person that wants to have friends, and they're not going to be comfortable like walking in somewhere and just being like, hey, yeah. anybody want to be friends with me? But they're, <laughs> they might have a, a, they'll know themselves, and maybe if they concentrate on it, they'll be like, okay, maybe I'm going to you know, go outside my uh, wheelhouse a little bit and look online for like a friendship meeting group or something like that. Yeah, that's, or, or it's a safe space. I have a really extroverted friend that can introduce me in a much more private setting that's not walking into a store and being like, does anyone want to play? Yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of that, knowing who you're going to play with is very important. Um, not everyone has a play group, but maybe you do have one. Maybe you have friends that all want to join the format together. Uh, we'll talk more about building a play group later, but just sort of keep that in mind too, which is like, if I do start playing, who are the people I will most likely begin to play with? That will also sort of help make sure you build and do things in the direction that ultimately makes it more of an easy flow into it. Yeah, if you know you already have some people you know that play Magic and you're probably likely to be playing with them, you probably already know something about them and the styles they play. Mm -hmm. That'll help you make decisions. You might also know, I don't know anybody who plays Magic. I just watch Game Nights. It looks fun and I want to try it. Yeah. In that case, you're more likely to be playing probably with people you don't know, right? In an LGS setting, maybe on Spell Table or yeah. on Magic Online or something like that. And just knowing that moving forward could help you. Maybe you know that like, oh, I have some friends who don't play, but... They like things like this. They play Warhammer or they play League of Legends or whatever. And I might be able to get them into the game. So I'm going to be playing with other new players maybe. Mm -hmm. So just sort of having a general idea of who you're likely to be playing with in the future will help you make decisions. Yep. And speaking of game nights, there is so much content online that's not just the stuff that we make. Uh, there are so many guides. There are so many podcasts and shows and gameplay. There, it, The internet is now filled with Magic the Gathering content, including written articles as well. So no matter where you want to start, I think it's always good to, to look online and even just ask the question you have the most, which is like, how do I play this commander? Or what is a thing to do? Or how do I X this? It, there's plenty of things that will pop up. We've made a few videos that are very basic. For instance, just how to play Magic the Gathering, if you've never played before, might be a good place to start. We've even made a video called How to Play Commander that is a bit more intense than this one. Talks about the rules and, as, and all the little limitations and stuff regarding our format. Uh, and then we also have deck building templates. We made plenty of them over the year, deck techs. There's so much out there. All those sh links, of course, will always be in the show notes. Yeah, if you're super new to the format and you haven't looked at any of our other videos about sort of beginning to play Magic or Commander, we'll put everything that's relevant to you in the show notes so just go below this video click the more info box and all those links will be down there mm -hmm. um and I would also say, like, there's so much Commander gameplay content. Of course, we're going to talk about Game Nights here because that's a show you make. But there's a ton of it out there. And I think yeah. all of it's good and valid to help you sort of figure out what looks fun to you from a gameplay perspective. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so you might see a deck that Jimmy plays on an episode of Game Nights. And just that just looks fun to you. You don't have to necessarily delve real deep into why. It might just be a good indicator. Like, hey, I'm going to build either that deck or something similar to yeah. it. Yeah, you can even start there. You don't even yeah. do everything we talked about. You could just literally start there and that's a great place to go. Yeah. Okay. So everything up to this point is trying to sort of give yourself an idea of what deck or what type of deck you might want to build for yourself, or at least narrow it down so you have a better chance of, of, of hitting the target. Yeah, yeah. Because it's very easy to go into Commander, and it's there's so many cards, and everything's viable, and just with no for structure or direction, it's just <laughs> overwhelming. You're just like, uh, I, what do I do? What do I do? Yeah, so being able to just narrow it down a little going into the card part of it, like now I'm going to start trying to get some cards so I can actually play, will at least make it... it you know, it, I, I kind of think of it like um, a restaurant... If you go into a restaurant and there's a million things on the menu, it like Cheesecake all, Factory, yes, it always like upsets me. I just want, <laughs> I just want In and Out or like a a a restaurant that's just like, listen, we got ten things. 
we just do these well. Yeah, yeah. Or these are our highlights. Yeah. So at least the little stars and the little chef's recommendation go a long way when they go into a restaurant. But yeah, I don't want to read a novel when if I need to order There's so food. many things on the menu. It's just like paralysis by analysis. I don't know. There's too much stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or if you go into an archery range and there's 20 targets, they're all moving and they're all big. What we're trying to do is help you go like, you don't want to actually aim for those. The one that you want to aim for is the one right there so that you kind of can just narrow down what you're doing so you're not uh, looking around not knowing what to do. Yeah, because if you just pull the bow back and just fired it randomly because there's so many targets out there, yeah. you're going to hit nothing. Yeah. You have a chance, though, if you pick one target, look at it, concentrate on it, and aim at it. Yeah, at least you'll be in that realm of where that target is is at. All okay, right. this, so, is the, this is the biggest questions here now. So, so let's talk about the best way to obtain cards and decks. We get asked this stuff constantly. Um, you know, people are like, how do I build my connect collection? How do I start out? What cards should I get at first? And let me just say at the beginning... <clears throat> Unless you have a lot of disposable income, <laughs> don't go about by buying booster boxes or booster packs and cracking open packs and boxes. Yeah, it's just not a good idea. The chances of you getting what you want, pretty low. And also, it's just you're going to have a lot of cards that you don't need. And then what are you going to do with those surplus of cards? Do you have a plan for that? No, they're just going to sit around. Uh, it doesn't seem like the best use of your time or money. Unless you really enjoy cracking packs and the thrill of it. Who doesn't? Yeah, but that's like Josh said, that's for people with a lot of disposable income that don't care so much about sort of what they're going to get. If you're just coming into the format and you said, hey, with this $100 bill, you could buy a booster box and have like a 2% chance of getting what you want, or you can get exactly what you want and more potentially, you're going to want to go with the safer route. I almost think the cracking of booster packs and boxes is better the more cards you already have because right you get something and you're like oh i already have these other things that go with it and when you're jimmy and i and you have 25 commander decks you can find uses for a lot of different things whereas when you're just starting out you don't have anything so going two percent in a hundred different directions doesn't help you yeah yeah you want to go more in one direction so you can get towards having one deck not to mention a lot of booster boxes will have cards that just never get played in command 95 percent of stuff right you're just yeah. never going to use it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. all right uh, i think that a good first step if you have and this obviously Depend. only works if you have friends that already play commander but one of the best ways to get in is to ask to borrow your friends decks yeah. so don't even buy any cards just, yeah, you've never played Commander before, you don't even know how to build a deck, and you're overwhelmed. Well, people around you may have already done it. Yeah, and this will give you a great way to sort of test out different things. I would do this for a number of play sessions if I could. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to play, I want to have fun. But That's how I, I started. Yeah, what I, this is how I started playing Magic originally was, yeah, you know, yeah. I didn't own my own cards for maybe the first couple of months I played. I was just using my friend's cards, and then finally I decided to buy my own. But it allowed me to sort of test the waters, try some things out, figure out what I liked. Mm -hmm. I knew I didn't like green because that's what they made me play because those are the cards <laughs> they weren't using. And I was like, okay, cool. Now I'm going to buy my own. I'm definitely not playing green. That's hilarious. Yeah, that's actually great process of elimination. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, obviously, this won't work if you don't have that friend group that has these cards. Even going to a game store and being like, can someone lend me a deck is a bit of a risky proposition for the people lending you the deck. So don't stress if you don't have this as an option. There are also lots of things online where you can load up a deck on tapped out or whatever oh, it is yeah. and, and draw hands and see what it looks like. Now, obviously, it's much different than playing in real life, but there are ways for you to take a car out for a test drive before you actually buy the darn thing. I do think there are lots of people that come in to want to play Commander. They have some friends that play Magic and they don't take advantage of mm -hmm. this part of it, which is, you know, your friends already have stuff for you to test drive so yeah. you can figure out, narrow down. Yeah. There are also your friends that may just have free cards for you. Uh, I've given away so many cards over the years when i first started go getting going craig blanchett is a huge reason why i had a collection he was just like yeah just take it jim just go for it and was, he's like these are the 95 percent of cards i'm never gonna use <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and there were some gems in there some things that that are actually crazy cool now but you know at the time it was more about i want to just play with you so let me give you some stuff to start off with here's an old pre-con here's an old deck just try it out see if you like it yep speaking of pre-cons they're great pre-cons are great and a great way to start enter the format and literally designed that way by the company that makes the game right yeah yeah so yeah. no surprise um yeah. magic's been routinely releasing these for almost nine ten years now and they're pre-constructed decks that's what we mean when we say pre-con yeah so they come with 100 cards and you can sleeve them up and they are legal to play right out of the box with no changes except for the most recent uh 
what was the deck the cheshiro deck has like two of one of the land so you gotta you gotta oh you gotta <laughs> it was a printing error but yeah, yeah, yeah that was yeah. a printing error but still you could probably do yeah. that no one's gonna give you guff about it <laughs> but um, this really is the simplest and quickest way to own your own cards and get playing in the format right yeah yeah and those decks also they are getting better and better with their designs and it's the quickest need you don't even need to sleeve it up let's be real here you could just you know do the old riffle shuffle and damage your cards a what? little bit yeah what you what mr double sleeve over here i mean people about yeah. to sleeve up a deck. i'm just saying that if you're like i gotta buy sleeves as well I, you know what you can play just bareback it's fine but but listen hold on rewind buy the sleeves because then you could sell the cards later and recoup your losses if you decide or you trade, don't like or trade them yeah, but yeah, if yeah. you just riffle shuffle right out of the box like it's destroying too much value that just hurts yeah okay don't, don't so, give that advice jeez so there are two ultra pro by the way there you go, yeah. sleeves. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so talking about precons, there are two types of precons that have been released in the pre in the recent years. There are what we call the set precons, and then there's a yearly commander product precon. So this is a little bit of a lot of the knowledge here, but just to sort of break it down, every single set that comes out now, they're going to release a couple of pre-constructed decks with the set that are themed around cards from that set, and it's just a couple of them. And typically, these don't have many new cards to the format. They're mostly made of cards that have been released before. Although lately, they have. Yeah, right? no, they have. They've, they've started to increase that yeah. number. But typically, when you buy a one of what we're calling the yearly pre-con releases those come in sets of four or five and those have tons of new cards uh typically they're sort of the most exciting moment for commander players every single year um but the set pre-cons are still very good for instance chishiro was uh the deck that post malone played on the last episode of game nights and the other deck had another commander called shorakai that josh played yeah i would say that it's actually not that uh, that important even for anybody who's getting into the format for the first time to know the difference between the set precons and the yearly commander precons either one will be fine for you yeah if you want to learn the you know the minuscule differences between what the products are that we can't even barely tell anymore <laughs> then you yeah. can do that later on down the line when you've been in the format for a while but any deck within the past few years that says you know commander deck on it and is in a you know a wizards of the coast box <laughs> it's packaging it's going to be it's going to be fine yeah and um, then if you go way back they have these old school precons that were sort of the first five or six years of commander from 2012 to 2018 or so you may find that wait why does this cost so much why is it hard to get it's just that they're older they're they're less in quantity available so we would recommend if you're just looking for something to pick up that's easy look for recent precons that are released in the, in the past couple of years yeah in fact i thought we'd pause here and sort of suggest what we think the best precon for newer players would be in the last nice. few years so uh, we're going to list off four here and part of it is price these are still generally around 40 dollars or less uh as of recording this and you know it is what <laughs> it is if a lot of people take our advice they'll go up um but we've also sort of thought about what are maybe a little bit more um strategies that are a little bit less complex yeah player since friendly a, yeah since again if you're starting out i don't think you want to go with anything that's got crazy sequencing or lines that you have to follow this is more you know i think these decks will be easier to pick up play right out of the box mm -hmm. they're strong they're good they'll be able to hold their own but they're not insanely complex yeah um the first one we'd recommend is primal genesis which is the gear ed sort of uh mixed rhino tokens attacky deck from commander 2019 can be strong can do some crazy stuff but it is mostly about attacking yeah putting big creatures out swinging with those making more of them you can watch lady danger play it in one of our game nights episodes yeah and it's from commander 2019 but still can be found for pretty cheap yep uh, Reap the Tides, which was the AC uh, deck from Commander Legends. Yep. This is a very strong deck that just generically sort of pays you off for playing lands, lets you draw cards. You're always going to have things to do. Yep. Again, big monsters, creature based, and you can refill your hand, obviously, in the colors and what the commander does. Uh, Upgrades Unleashed is the Chishiro deck that uh, Post Malone played Chishiro, but he built a new deck around it. He didn't play the pre-con, but this pre-con is pretty good right out of the box, has good value. Just came out in Neon Dynasty, so still easily, you can find it easily, I suppose, um, and is quite strong. Yep. And this last one, I think is a little more complicated than the other three, but it's a very strong deck and a fun one too. It's Lorehold Legacy. It's the Oskir deck from Strixhaven. Plays around with um, Graveyard Recursion and Artifacts. Has mm -hmm. a lot of value. It's amazing to be putting a Boros deck on this list, but... <laughs> But it is a cool deck and a fun deck, and I think if you're looking for a little bit more complexity but not a crazy high complexity ceiling, that's a good one. Yeah, and this has a pretty good split of the colors as well. I think each of the colors is represented here. So if you take a look at those decks, you can just look them up online. You can sort of see what the commander does and ask yourself, does that match what I want to do? And if it does, it might be a great place to start. Yeah, channelfireball.com slash command is a great place to uh, pick up those pre-cards. Yes, sir. 
All right, uh, we got a lot more to talk about. We're going to be talking about, you know, what singles to buy, mm -hmm. how other ways to sort of procure cards, then how to find a play group and figure out who you're playing the game with. But before we get into all that, we're going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. We now return to the Underworld Cook with Asmorana Mardika Dice Tinnacoldicar, brought to you by Factor, only on the Food Token Network. Oh, welcome back, food fans. Look, I had a great recipe prepared, but then the ingredients for my Beeble Boar staged a jailbreak, and Grizzlebrand ate my air fryer. Now I'm hungry, tired, and totally out of time to cook. Thank the nine hells I've got these meals from Factor that are ready to eat in only two minutes. Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7. Fresh, never frozen prepared meals, they're so delicious you wouldn't believe they're actually good for you. They deliver chef-crafted, nutritious meals straight to your door with no meal prep, so you don't have to hunt down and subdue any of your ingredients. You can choose from over 29 dishes, including vegan, keto, and low-calorie options. But tonight, I'm having their chickpea curry with forbidden black rice. Oh no! They know I'm eating the forbidden black rice! I can't go back to prison! I gotta go! go, go, go. Head to go.factor75.com slash command120 and use code command120 for $120 off. That's code command120 at go.factor75.com slash command120 for $120 off. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Check out betterhelp.com slash command zone. Hi there, I'm Veraska, and this is my boyfriend, Jace. Hello. Since we started dating, a lot has happened. We fought an evil god, Jace's ex betrayed us. I lost my job to a dragon. We've had stuff to work through, and it wasn't always easy maintaining effective communication. I mean, I'm no mind reader. No, I am a mind reader, but it's still hard. That's why we turned to BetterHelp for couples counseling. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and the Command Zone listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash command zone. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash command zone. Now our relationship is as solid as a rock. And if it goes downhill, I can always turn him into a rock. <laughs> She's kidding. Am I? When the Command Zone first began, it was just Jimmy and me. But since then, we've grown into a team of talented editors, skilled VFX artists, and writers so masterful, I consider them my personal heroes. Really, guys? Hiring is not easy, though. If you want to find the best people, you need the best tools. That's why we use Indeed, the hiring partner where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Browsing tons of different job sites just takes too long, but Indeed can do it all. Plus, it's the only job site where you don't pay anything unless you find candidates that meet your requirements. That is time and money you could spend getting gifts for your beautiful writers. All right, come on, guys. And Indeed saves you more time with talent-finding tools like virtual interviews and Instant Match, which gives you a short list of candidates the moment you sponsor a post. Then you can invite them to apply right away, like when, I don't know, you need to hire a new writing team ASAP. Mm -hmm. Start hiring right now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash Command Zone. This offer is valid through March 31st, so go to Indeed.com slash Command Zone to claim your $75 credit before March 31st. Again, Indeed.com slash Command Zone. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right, welcome back to the show. Now that you know what you're going to do, you know the colors, you know your play groups, you have a lot of information, you have a lot of guidance, now it's time to talk about one of the most important parts of Commander, which is it's not just pre-cons. The pre-cons have cards that you want to upgrade. There are cards that you want, maybe you want to build your deck from scratch. So that means you're going to buy cards and decks. And how are you going to go about that? Because there are over 20, 30,000 different cards to choose from. Seems really overwhelming, but actually it's a bit simpler once you get start breaking it down piece by piece yeah to quote to quote our good friend the professor buy singles buy singles uh so probably the best way to go about if you're going to upgrade a pre-con or build a deck from scratch is to figure out what specific cards you want usually online mm. and then purchase those specific cards don't take the lottery ticket uh <laughs> version which is um Getting booster packs and yeah. things like that. Also, don't do the shotgun approach, which is just, ah, I just want to buy all this stuff, and hopefully some of it works and some of it doesn't. Um, we put out videos about how to upgrade your pre-cons for under a certain amount of money as well. So there's lots of resources out there so that you don't need to overspend and also overwhelm yourself. 
Yeah, and I would say you don't want to go super deep, super early. You just are thinking, I probably have this play style. These are my goals, probably. But this is all theoretical until you're actually playing games. Yeah. So you want to get to the playing games part early and make sure that, oh, this deck, I do find fun and I do want to upgrade it. I've seen a lot of people, and I've done this myself, where I built a deck, thought it was going to be awesome, spent money on the cards, ordered them. They got oh, yeah. here, put it all together, play it a couple times and realize, ooh, I don't like this that much. Decks we built but hated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it happens to a lot of us, and we're trying to have you avoid that, especially when you're early in the format. Because Jimmy and I, we own a ton of cards. We've been playing for forever. We have all, you know, our whole jobs and everything are around this game. So it's not that big a deal when I build a deck and it I end up disliking it because the amount of mon monetary resource I put into it are not super high. It's time, obviously. Yeah. But like I, ha I probably owned most of the cards, maybe ordered, you know, a dozen or so that I didn't have. But that's, and then a lot of those cards, I'm like, I can still use these in other things that I build later. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if it's your first deck ever, like that's a pretty big blow if you don't like it. Yeah. Don't get burned. Don't burn yourself. Uh, it's actually something I did when I first built my deck. I put a list of like 200 cards. I had no idea what most of them did, if it worked or not, but I just thought they were cool and I got all of them and I realized, oh no, I don't have any money left to, to buy the cards i actually need after figuring out that none of these work right and you already priced yourself into half of those cards not working in your deck because you can only put 100 in yeah and what i'm gonna do with those i don't have another deck to put them in. i'm just sort of dead in the water so big one here is setting a budget this is something that even myself and now in my 30s i'm still tr having trouble with but it's still a very valuable thing to do which is ask yourself okay how much do i want to spend at first how much do i have in terms of disposable income expendable income that i want to spend on this deck and the cards to upgrade it let's say it's fifty dollars a hundred dollars whatever it is once you set that budget you'll know okay cool i'm actually about to overpass this budget do i really want to do it so you can ask yourself that question when you get there and you can sort of figure out okay if i have this much money then i know that i can only buy this much and that's going to really help me make sure i don't overspend go too overboard and end up with something i'll regret it's really great advice because as soon as you set those parameters too it really defines when you're looking at things whether you should even consider them or not mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. i'm only gonna spend 50 dollars, which is fine i think you can easily upgrade a precon easily for $50. Oh, yeah. And and Mitch at the Commander's Quarters and the Commander's Brew guys can teach you how to build decks, hold decks for $50. But if you're doing that, you can be like, you know, you're looking around at EDH Rec and you come up to Sensei's Divining Top and you see that it's like, you know, what is a it? A lot. 40, 30 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it is. You just know, like, I'm, am I going to spend half of my budget or... You know, all, of, all it. of it on this one card? No, I'm not. So you don't even have to think about it. And now you can be Googling like budget replacement for this card. And oh, you're yeah. find Crystal Ball and some other stuff. And maybe you'll spend a buck or two on a card that does a similar thing, but you're definitely not going to consider that card. Whereas if you don't have a budget set, you might be like, ah, this one card, okay. <laughs> and then, you know, you end up accidentally spending way more than you wanted to. Yeah. Another great way to save is shopping at an LGS. So obviously local game stores were hit really hard because of the pandemic. And a lot of them have just been completely out of operation. But for those that are still around, the business that you provide as a local customer is huge because you also can have a great relationship with the people that work at the LGS. And that's a really important way to have them look at your list and go, hold on, your budget's how much? Okay, we recommend doing this instead of that. And for the most part, I think you'll find that game store owners and game store employees are on your side, especially ones that know the format and have been playing this for longer than you. They can give you great advice so that you don't slip up. Well, if you think about incentives and how they're lined up too, if you go up and you say, hey, I'm a... I'm, I'm excited about Commander. I just learned about it. And I'm trying to get into the format. They see, oh, this is a person who might be able to come back to yeah. the store for years to come and give me business. And so their incentive is the same as yours. They want you to have a good time and like it. Yeah. Because if, as long as that is achieved, you're going to be a customer that keeps coming back to them for potentially years and years. So that's a good, I like those incentive structures. I like when it's like they're motivated in the same way that I am so that in the, in the way that I want them to be. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to talk later, but it is like having a good relationship with the LGS owners or people at your LGS can be helpful later when you're trying to find people to play. Yeah, true. So definitely use those resources because it does help build a relationship as well. Yep. Um, of course, they're shopping digitally, which is, you know, often you're going to be able to find deals and get good prices. And we're talking about marketplaces in our sponsorship call out about how like when you have a lot of vendors in the same place, if I'm right here saying, I'll sell you this for this much, whoa, if whoa, there's uh, a I'll guy- I'll sell you for less. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you're someplace and there's only one person, their price setting can be much higher because they're looking around. There's like, well, if you want this, you either have to buy from me or go someplace else, which could be very inconvenient and far away. Yeah. Whereas if there's a lot of sellers standing next to each other, there is, he's like, I'll sell for 20, I'll sell for 19, okay, 18, 17, 16. <laughs> you, you know, all of a sudden you can get uh, pretty good prices that way. So shopping digitally can, can help a lot. Also, it's a good easy way to kind of quickly look at it 
you know, mm-hmm. put it out. A lot of times it'll tell you the whole total all at once, which helps too. Yeah, you can also just press one button a lot of times and get all your shopping done instantly without having to sort of pick and choose from a bunch of different places. So that's a lot of the convenience that digital gives you. And not to mention when you're using the Channel Fireball Marketplace and promo code command, you're actually shopping from real game stores. So it still is getting that same mm-hmm. thing accomplished. Now you do have to run the risk of putting it into the mail and who knows it with the quality, you know, it may not be shipped at exactly the pristine quality you expected, but that's sort of the upside of going to a game store and being able to look at the car before you buy it but if you don't care as much about that stuff and i I find that i almost do all my shopping digitally especially in the last couple of years obviously yeah well i mean there's a convenience factor too so those cards will often take a little while to get to you when you shop digitally so you know if you want the cards tomorrow because you're you know you know a game's happening then an lgs that's right around you know that's in your town is going to be a little bit faster getting the cards to you Mm -hmm. but the inventory might be smaller too sometimes uh you'll go to your lgs and they just don't have certain cards or the version you want yeah all that yeah uh this last one i think is something that's kind of a lost art but when man when i started playing magic like this we did it. this constantly <laughs> this yeah. was the main way i got cards yeah especially now at, at conventions and stuff you see this happening all the time but trading trading is a key part of being a part of a collectible card game yep you have something i want i have something you want well let's put them all on the table and do a little bit of bartering maybe i'll add in a little spice here or you'll equalize it there and then blammo you get a card that you don't need anymore and you get multiple cards or just one card that you really do want in your deck and maybe sometimes you even come out on top yeah and this is safer than ever because of the internet so it's very easy to sort of check values like back in the day it was a lot harder so you could get right. least less likely to happen now which is good because if you're new you may not know the ins and outs of the price of everything but there are online resources that allow you to check mm-hmm. um this is another way to build relationships with people at lgs's and things like that because you have to be in a space where there are other players in order to do it and and also this allows you and another person who maybe doesn't play commander but plays a different format to have a symbiotic relationship oh right where like there's these cards that are good in standard but you don't need them because you're going to play commander and so that's important to them because they need the standard cards they're playing standard whereas they're not if they're not a commander player these cards don't mean as much to them so you can have a value swap that's even but it's actually positive for both of you Mm -hmm. because you get something you can use for something you couldn't and they get the same thing yeah and I think it builds relationships you can do it within your play group I've even done like card loan programs oh yeah i'll just loan you these cards for a couple of weeks let you test them out and you'll loan me something or whatever it is and and that way you can know okay okay i actually want to trade for that card now that i've had it and i really like it they're like great well let's let's get our binders and figure out how to trade oh i like that last point because it really leads into our next section which is be resourceful yes please so think outside the pumpkin not everybody is going to be able to afford you're gonna have a budget you might not be able to get every single card that you dreamed of for this deck that you're building yeah um but there's many different ways that players can be resourceful and sort of stretch their dollars or their collection or whatever farther than just you know what the cards would tell you that they could do right yeah so let's say you have multiple decks and you want to put a soul ring in all of them but you only have one soul ring and you don't want to go out and buy another it doesn't feel right because you'd rather spend that money on something else so there are ways that people have done this we've seen it happen all the time because if you have one card technically unless you're playing all your decks simultaneously that card could go into every single deck you could take the process of like all right i'm done with this deck let me take out these cards and put them into this deck because i need them in this one but there's actually a lot of different ways that people go around this which is they'll have to make it more convenient yeah more convenient right i have the card right you can see it right here so i'm technically going to play in this deck but i want to take it out of a sleeve and re-sleeve and remember all that so there's lots of different ways of going about it our friend Vinny introduced us to his binder system where he'll have let's say one of a more valuable card but he doesn't want to buy six copies of it for his six decks so he'll just have a placeholder and then if you ever need a check well there it is or he does something like people have uh, these blank cards from drafts that have double-sided flip cards that have a magic back on them, but it's blank on the front. So you can write whatever you want and be like, this actually functions as this card. Yeah, they're called checklist cards. Yeah, checklist cards, yeah. Yeah, Vinny, uh, we'll link the episode where we talked to him about it in the show notes, but he's his binder system is ingenious, right? We talked earlier, well, Sensei's Divining Top, it's a very expensive card. If you did happen to, happen to own that card, that is likely to want to go in a number Many. of different decks. Yeah. Like your first deck might want it, but your second deck probably does, and your third deck too, right? But you don't want to buy a second and a third copy of it. So yeah, this system where what Vinny does is he has that 
that card. Let's say it's the Sensei's Divining Top. And he has all his decks sleeved in the same type of sleeve. So he doesn't have to like switch them out of sleeves. Right. So his his cards that are his binder cards, his more expensive cards he wants to use in multiple decks, he keeps them in a binder in the sle- same sleeves as everything else. Then he has that checklist card in each of his decks, the three decks that says Sensei's Divining Top on it. So he just wrote on a Sharpie, Sensei's Divining Top, stuck it in a sleeve and put it in his deck. Now, when he draws that card and is going to play it, he just says, hey, this is the top. I'm going to swap it for the real card over here in my binder, mm-hmm. and then I'm going to play it. So when you're playing the game, to, to everybody else playing, he's got a real top on the table that he's playing with. And then all he does is at the end of that game, he just puts the top back into the binder and puts the checklist card back into the deck, and now he's good to go. Yep. And I consider this to be something that's actually good for the other players that Vinny's playing with, because the alternative to him doing this is every time going through each card in his deck, pulling out the ones, and then shuffling it into the other deck, yeah. which just costs a lot of time. So I'm appreciative of Vinny because he's found a way to make that faster for all the other people he's playing with, but he still gets the advantage of having multiple copies, quote-unquote, of his very expensive cards without actually having to own multiple copies. Yep, that's the beauty of the singleton format. You only can play one copy of most cards in your deck, so technically it could be in every single one of your decks. It really, you, There really isn't a great reason to own more than one of any card except for <laughs> convenience uh, except for and if you're lazy like i am yeah, yeah collecting yeah. and all that good stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, i like this next point that you have which is when you're buying cards or you're trying to be resourceful don't get cards necessarily when you're starting out that can only go in one specific deck yeah colorless cards i would be way more likely to say yeah that's that's a good purchase than cards that are of certain colors and of unique strategies. So if you're going, you know, because colorless card can go in any deck. So in your mm-hmm. example about the soul ring, these come in pre-con so people don't tend to be short on them. Arcane Signet maybe is a little bit better or let's yeah, say yeah. one of the talisman or something like that. You have it from, you know, it, you want it for a deck. That's more likely to be something that's a good idea to to get your hands on than like, I don't know, a, a, a card that is a red card that goes in this specific deck and is very good because the thing is if you end up not liking that deck or wanting to take apart and build a new deck later the colors cards can go in any of your decks if you yep. have sense we keep saying sense is dividing top i don't want people to think like <laughs> saying you should buy that particular card it just is kind of a ubiquitous card that goes in a lot of decks um if you, signet. yeah if you have that you can always put it into a deck it's the it'll go in any deck that exists yeah and it's good enough that it also will be good in any deck that you put it in, even if it's not the most optimal of cards. And so those cards do tend to be okay purchases. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying spend 50 bucks on cards early on, but those types of cards that go in a lot of decks, because, hey, worst case scenario, I can use this. Yeah, and it's, again, it's just a good card. It, it You'll find it in most of the pre-cons, which is why they include the most pre-cons. So you don't need to worry about buying a lot of them. But if you do need to be like, you know, I'm just going to get three soul rings for my three decks. And I know if I ever take one part one of the decks, like Josh said, you just put that into any other deck you make. Hopefully you do. I would sort of think the same. It's to a lesser extent about staple cards. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cyclonic Rift, right? You just, if you build a deck with blue in it, you can always put a Cyclonic Rift in it. Again, very expensive, so maybe not early on. But Smothering Tithe, another card that's not super cheap. Wayfarer's Bobble. Yeah. Oh, Wayfarer's Bobble's a great one, right? Can go If you're going to play a deck with more than one colors, then you could put that card in the deck. Yeah. Uh, Mana-based cards are good ones, too. Again, we're not saying buy dual lands, but like a Triome or something. Yeah. It's a pretty good pickup because... Good chance if you have a four or five three color deck, it's going to go in there. Um, the two color, like a Shockland or something, again, y- you'll never find yourself in a situation where you're like, boy, I can't find a deck to use this in, and I spent a bunch of money on it. Yeah, and hopefully, if you're really locked in on what colors you love, that Shockland will be able to go into your next deck because it'll share some of those colors. So if it's like it's a red blue one, it's like, great. Well, I was, is it Mage at first? Now I'm a Grixis Mage or a Teamer Mage. And those cards still work in the new deck because they still identify with sort of what you wanted to do in the first place um you had a note here to build across multiple colors to not run into reusing cards as often i think early on yeah that too it's it's a good idea like if you already have this color deck and you're building your second or third deck maybe don't overlap the colors as much because now if i get a black card i have a deck that has black in it rather than three decks that are green and red yeah (laughs) you know what i mean so that i have use for any cards that happen across because Let's be honest, you're going to crack some packs sometimes. You're going to come across cards that are cool that, you know, you don't have a use for. Or might inspire you to build an entire deck around. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is a big one. Before you buy or trade for that card and you don't know, oh, it's 20 bucks, it's 15, whatever it is, test it out. 
You can 100% test it out with playtest cards. This is a very common occurrence, especially when you're just starting out or building a new deck or a new brew. You don't actually know if it works or if it's gonna be as efficient or as awesome as you want it to be. So instead of investing all that money into something that you may never use, why not just test it out? Use a playtest version, use a checklist card, write it on a Sharpie. Obviously this should not be in your deck when you finally go sit down and play with people, but it's a great way to goldfish some hands to see, hey, can I just play with this? I have a couple of cards in here. I don't know if I'm gonna put them in, but you all know what they are. It's this and that. I just want you to know beforehand and then try it out. And then that way you'll know when I played it, it didn't happen. Nothing really happened. I didn't want to use it or it sat in my hand the whole time. So you know what? I actually don't want to go and purchase this. I can do use that money for something else. Yeah, right. If you go to the store and you're gonna buy a pair of jeans, you'll usually try on the jeans. Correct. Right. So if you're going to buy a sort of feast and famine or something that's decently, you know, it's a, it's not super cheap, then I think it's a good idea to have some experience playing with the card first before, you know, because there's tons of cards and Jimmy and I will attest to this. Even now, we know magic very well. Talk about an hour a week as our jobs for what, seven years now? Mm -hmm. Still, I'll see cards and be like, that's going to be awesome in this deck. And I'll put it in the deck and then I'll get it in my hand and yeah. I'll be like, this is not awesome. I thought it was going to be awesome, but I didn't realize like this is just not the play pattern I want or yeah. it doesn't do what I thought it did or blah, blah, blah. I so, didn't read the card right. There's a lot of that that happens too. Yeah, I just thought it was going to work with my commander in a way, but I found out that like what my deck really wants to do is more this than that. And yeah. so I'm going to cut it. And that really sucks if you're on a budget or you're early on. It's much better to have tried it out, played a few games with it. People will mostly be uh, fine with you doing that if you if you... Um, make sure that you let them know that's what you're doing. And Jimmy and I, you know, I think it's going to be hard to avoid sort of the proxy conversation here, which I think is a hot button issue in Commander and everybody has their own feelings about proxy, uh, proxying cards. And Jimmy and I, I think are on the record being mostly fine with proxies if people let you know before the game and everything like that. Communication. Yep. And w totally fine with people like testing, like, hey, I'm thinking of buying this, but I don't know because it's expensive and I just want, I, every time I would be like, yeah, yeah. you should be smart about it. Uh, in general, if it's long term, I, I think I'm more comfortable if people, you know, own the cards or at least own a copy of the card like Vinny does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it is a collectible card game and I do believe it is correct to support the companies that are building a thing that you like as well. But in general, like testing stuff, trying stuff out, I, I would encourage it. Yeah, and just clear it with your uh, the play people you're playing with too so you don't show up with a deck that's all forest with things sharpened on top of them and be like, all right, I'm ready to play with my commander deck. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I would say I wouldn't want to do that for an entire deck or even a large portion of a deck because it does ruin the aesthetic integrity of the game a but little bit. But it's also bit. hard to understand what's happening. Yeah, so notably. you want it to be like only a couple of cards in your deck that you're doing that with. Yeah, otherwise, I think at least make the proxies look better. So again, it's just like if you I was playing... Um, an, uh, an MMO or something online and somehow another character could come in and make the graphics way worse. Like, I don't yeah. want that, right? Like, I, I don't want my gra my aesthetic uh, experience to be worse. Yeah, uh, and then finally, there's a lot of free cards flying around. Uh, draft Chaff is the name of cards that are, when people are done drafting, they're like, well, I don't need any of these cards. I'll give them back to the store or I'll donate them somewhere. So oftentimes, you'll just see piles of cards left around and you'll be like, can I go through them? And they'll be like, yeah, 100%, go for it. I don't care if you want all those commons. Yeah, and sometimes a lot of those commons are very pleasant playable in commander especially if you're just starting out it could just even be lands it could even be the tap lands that give you a life when they enter the battlefield and it could be a cool i need a little more color fixing um so it's a great way to just start off uh which is just like building your collection without needing to pay a single dollar and sometimes there are a bunch of uncommons that just have really tons of utility in like a corval deck for instance uh, oh, yeah. and like afr the adventures in the forgotten realm one of the cards was that little innkeeper prosperous innkeeper i saw those things lying around everywhere and that card is amazing in the corval deck and it's like great you can just get that for free without having to go and buy it because your your store had a draft and the players that are more indentured don't need every card so they leave some behind and usually it's a great place to just pick up some awesome free value uh, another thing we didn't write down but it just made me think of it jimmy is there are sort of non-traditional places to find cards as well so mm -hmm. a good one is like goodwill oh yeah uh, a lot of people will kind of go and just sell like lots of stuff and goodwill will just often have like a box full of random magic cards or maybe there's pokemon cards and you go mixed in there even but you can usually get pretty good prices and a lot of times you'll get you know find some treasure in there yeah, as well hidden ones yeah um also just garage sales so if you're driving around and you see a garage sale it might be worth it to stop and take a look because when they have magic cards a lot of times you can get you know a big box of magic cards and just get a bunch of stuff for a couple bucks yeah one uh, person's trash is another person's treasure didn't you you had somebody that like got something at a garage sale that had multiple dual lands in it yeah 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 it was at it was at the goodwill actually and goodwill even has uh their own website as well it's like shop goodwill and so is ebay e tons of times people just sell lots of tons of stuff including rares and mythic rares and look they may not be the best 
cards in the world, but you can get it for way cheaper than buying individual cards. And if you want to sort of take a shot on that, it's a great way to also just like dump a ton of cards out and be like, let's try and build something fun. That'd be a good way, I think, if I was starting a group and everybody was new to Magic, so nobody had a collection, yeah. and you just want to build some decks, just buying a lot on eBay that you know it's not going to have like all the best cards in it, but you're going to get 5,000 cards, and there'll be rares and mythics and stuff in there, and now you can build some decks from it. Yeah. Because you're all in the same playing field if you're all using the same collection, and it's kind of there. Um, it's a little bit different, I think, if you're going to try and build your deck and go join an existing play group, then you're yeah. probably better to buy singles on, on the marketplace or something like that. Buy but, singles. But think about non-traditional places to find magic cards, because once in a while, you can find some really good deals. Yeah, and you'll, you'll, you'll surprise yourself. All right, so the next step we have written down, so you've kind of, you know, you've acquired some cards, you've got a pre-con, maybe upgraded a little bit, you found some, uh, some singles. Mm-hmm. Now, I think this is a step that a lot of, especially new players, should think about, but even new to the format, even if you've played limited, um, you know, modern or whatever, test your deck, goldfish your deck. I think at this point, you know, you're going to want to know what your deck does, what the lines kind of are. What what card do you tutor for when you're in this position? What's the best? We always talk about the best card in our deck, right? Mm -hmm. It's good to know what the best card in your deck is because then when you have a situation where you're tutoring and, you know, you don't need a board wipe, you don't need a removal spell, you're not really ready to win the game, what card should I go get? If yeah. you goldfish enough, you can awfully know, oh, this card just makes my deck hum. I'm going to go find that thing. And so showing up, uh, to play for the first time, it will go a lot more smoothly if you really know your deck inside and out. Yeah, it's the same as putting on a pair of jeans before you buy them, or if you're going to take a driving test, you practice driving before you take the driving test. So having a little bit of time in the vehicle, in the deck, knowing, okay, cool, I always want to try and play this ramp spell as soon as possible, or going, wait a minute, I drew too many hands and they all have these really expensive cards I can't cast. Maybe I need to cut down on that. Yeah, lower my curve. So you need to be able to have some of that knowledge and that way it'll make your play experience better too. It, it sucks when you sit down for an hour long game and you make a couple of really big mistakes just because you're not used to doing it. And playing I, the cards. I think, you know, when it's other people are going to have their decks and their cards and you, especially early in the format, can't be expected to kind of keep tabs or know everything yeah. out there. Knowing your stuff, though, is something that you have control over because you own all that stuff and you can spend the time that it takes to kind of know how it works and what all your own stuff does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's going to be hard to keep track of everybody's things and I don't want people to be intimidated about that. Just <laughs> that's going to happen. But the baseline of knowing your own deck, I think you can be pretty good at it going in for the first time. Okay, we're finally there. We're ready to play a real game of Magic the Gathering of Commander. <laughs> it took a while. It took a whole podcast to get there. But very excitingly, hopefully your deck is ready. You are prepared. And uh, oh, yeah, by the way, get some dice or a way to track your life total as well. Maybe a piece of paper and pen. Uh, and now you need to find a play group. Yeah, There's, we get this question a lot, right? I want to play Magic. I've watched Game Nights. It looks really fun. I don't know how to find the people to play with. Or I'm intimidated. I don't know how to even begin the conversation or where to go. I, uh, I guess oh, I'm stuck. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to give you a little bit of advice here. Uh, obviously, if you know people that already play Magic, that's your best place to start. Yeah. Um, if they don't play Commander yet, maybe you could get them to try to, try to start it a commander group and i would start small like let's say that you know some people that play magic and they're friends of yours or whatever maybe you were in a group that likes to play modern and you uh -huh. think commander looks fun maybe you can convince one of them to try playing commander one-on-one -on -one, and you can slowly kind of convert some people in the group to give it a shot we've heard a lot of people sort of moving from playing standard or they still play standard they don't have to stop right you can do both yeah but you know they do commander sometimes now where they used to do mostly x or y yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's how I started with Craig as well. We would just sit there and play 1v1, and it shaped the way I built my decks for a little bit, but it was also just a great way to be like, oh, cool, I really kind of get the hang of what's happening now. I understand how board wipes work and why they're so good, and that sort of experience you can only get by playing. And so by playing 1v1, totally fine. Um, but if you can find a play group that already has a few players in it, or that's why you started playing in the first place, that's perfect. You're already set. But a lot of people don't have that. So if you don't know any Magic players, it can be really intimidating to try and meet people, especially if it's brand new people at the store. You don't know if your decks can be able to hang. So a good place to start at an LGS is just talking to the store owner, someone that's that's running an event or whatever it is, because they will be able to help you 
they know, oh, there's a brand new player. Well, guess what? There's a new group that just started last week. They're looking for a couple more people. It, I think they would totally be fine if you sat in. I can even go and help you ask if you'd like. Again, the store owner is incentivized to help you for a lot of reasons. Probably they're just a nice person that likes games, but also <laughs> they have a store and they want, you know, more players to exist in their community because that's good for them. Yeah. Um, and they're going to have their finger on the pulse of the local community and they'll probably be like, oh yeah, of course, Joe over there, he runs a commander night every Thursday nights at his house and they mm -hmm. play all the time. Let me introduce you. They're always looking for players or hey, here at the store on these nights we play. and that Yeah, yeah, come back on Wednesday. That's the perfect time for the new players. We yeah. have a new commander night. Or and whatever. there's going to be 10 commander players already here. And each one of those is a potential person that could introduce you to more players or invite mm -hmm. you to their play group or say, you know, and be open about what it is. Like, hey, I'm new. I've Commander looks fun. I built this deck and I'm trying to get in the format, you know. Uh, can I play with y'all? And man, commander players for you know 99 percent of them all they really want is more people that play commanders because those are more people they could play with so they're very welcoming you know at gps and things you see it all the time where yeah people are like yeah come in sit down we'll help you out mm -hmm. and people are very cool about it and um so so i would i would i would try and get the gumption up to like just have those conversations and let them know where you're at and just be very open about it and people will generally want to help you and if you are one of those players that sees a new player mm. it, you know you can help steward the format a lot and be welcoming and help them out so it's also sort of on you that's listening potentially to know this when this is happening or if you're at a convention to have a more open atmosphere because that is a great way to help give someone a great first time experience and as a result they could be your new greatest commander friend who knows yeah grow your community that's really important and, and on the flip side you know their social interactions are hard. They're hard for everybody. Not everybody um, is good at them, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think we've all had awkward social interactions or, or social <laughs> interactions where even the people who are good at them, right? I think, Jimmy, we're both kind of good in social situations. I've still had tons of times where I walked away going, why'd I say that? Or that was, <laughs> that was weird. Or, you know. Yeah, I've been very nervous approaching new groups and stuff, too. Even yeah. just, you know, even before we were sort of known for the command zone, I'd be like, ah, I don't want to play with anyone. I'm going to go. Yeah, so just knowing that and allowing for some leeway of like, hey, that didn't maybe go as well as I I wanted to but mm -hmm. it's not going to make me think hey i'm it can't work and i'll never make it work yeah that's going to be like an expected thing that could happen and i'm going to chalk that up to like you know that's just the luck of the draw sometimes a little bit of a bad experience can happen but i'm it's not going to stop me from still trying to do this thing that i want to do which is find people to play commander with yeah um other places to look because lgs i think is kind of uh, obvious hopefully you if you have that you would try it but some communities don't have it and call ahead by the way and say hey do you have a commander night for new players and let them know and they'll help you out for sure um schools often have gaming clubs so if you are you know we've heard about gaming clubs at m middle school all the way on up to college so mm -hmm. there are often gaming clubs that play magic and a lot of times even if there's a gaming club that's not specifically for magic a tabletop gaming club or something like that will very likely have people in it mm -hmm. that have played magic or do play magic because or know how yeah yeah because those uh interests often overlap by quite a bit yeah <clears throat> you can also look online facebook has tons of groups oh, uh cool. especially local ones you can be like i live in minnesota in saint paul saint paul magic the gathering on google or facebook you'll probably find here is the saint paul gathering we gather every week at this bar or at this library and then we play um so that's a great way to start there as well same with reddit they'll often have you know uh, like people being like hey i'm visiting this place for the weekend is mm -hmm. there any good lgs's here and people give tons of recommendations now just make sure you look up and call beforehand because sometimes those stores will be out of business or those things won't happen anymore but i've found when i've traveled that's the way i go find new magic stores and i play that multiple fnms across the country as a result yeah it's low impact too to just send a message over facebook or something like that you're not putting yourself out mm -hmm. there that much right so i agree with you you shouldn't just show up and assume it's going to happen and do some communicating try and get a response from them first but there is a lot of that stuff going on and so it's n it's and and then a lot of people are like, well, I'm in a small community, so they don't have that. A lot of small communities do have this type of thing going on or something near them. There's not very many places in the U.S. where there's not like a medium-sized town within driving distance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so hopefully you could find something. Uh, you know, some luck I had, and this is actually how Jimmy and I met. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is just having magic cards or paraphernalia around me. So if you're just like at work and you just bring some magic cards and like put them on your desk or something... That is an invitation for a conversation starter. And this is literally how Jimmy and I met because he had magic cards with him one day. Yeah, I, had, I just like, I like dressing up my work area with cards. I had like a Star Wars, old Star Wars card. I had a Sarah Angel and a hard top. And I was like, oh, cool. This represents who I am. So I'm just gonna put it on my desk. 
Yeah, and I was like, hey, is that a magic card? And I'm like, yes, that is. This command zone would literally not exist, maybe, if that yeah. didn't happen, right? So just having, wearing a magic shirt, maybe, or just having those cards around you might cause somebody to sort of initiate a conversation. Hey, you play magic? Yeah. That could change your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally happened with us. So, yeah. Yeah. We're not saying like cosplay as Karn to work and help someone <laughs> <laughs> ask you about it, but that definitely can help. Another thing too is if you go and let's say you're just a standard or a limited player and you know f and happening, you can bring a commander deck not intending to play commander, do the event, do the draft, and then afterwards, oftentimes you'll find people be like, hey, anyone want to play commander? And then right. that starts as a result. So you don't have to also go with the intention of playing commander to find the commander play group. That's a good, that's a really good point. And then of course the final, I think, you know, probably people screaming at their radio or whatever way is online. There are spell table. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a spell table discord. Spell table is a way to play over webcam. So you're playing with physical cards, but you've got a camera and a computer down, yeah. and a microphone and other people. And so you can see the four players board states. There's a, uh, image recognition software tied to it, which is great for newer players because you can actually just mouse over and click on the other players' boards and their cards yep. and bring them up and really see what they do. You can also type it in and find the card too. Yeah, so it's uh, honestly, it can be easier than in real life because you have to be like, hey, can I can I see that? Can I grab that? <laughs> Whereas like, you don't even have to ask in spell table. You just like click on it, boom, yeah. it pops up, read it. You know, you don't have to bother anybody. There's obviously differences between the social dynamics when you are really in person and when you're not, which... I think a, a lot of people would be nice if you're more introverted or whatever. They don't have to see your face. You're a little bit more anonymous, things like that. Spell table is its own ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So I think the decks tend to be a little bit stronger because of the anonymity you might run into. Uh, a Certain cards like taking cards out of other players' decks don't happen as much either. So yeah, a little bit stronger, you know, uh, decks in general, a little bit less focused on um, the social aspect of it just because it's not quite as easy to do over spell table so the, there's some upsides and some downsides or uh, with how i like to play anyway but it can definitely get you games in and also a way to become comfortable playing and with your own deck against other real decks yeah good point yeah so you you can really you know get on spell table again we'll have those links in the show notes so it's easy to find um and and you can again in the same respect let people know like i'm new to the game in the discord server to find people that are willing to play with new players and there or are, are new that, themselves yeah yeah and then get in games specifically with you know people who are willing or want to be with players of your level yeah and I, I think that's a opportunity that's harder to be afforded to you when you're at like an lgs or something where you just kind of get the 10 people that are there there could yeah. be hundreds or even thousands of people playing spell table at once and that's just a lot more people a lot more chance that there's some other newer players or people that are good at teaching other players and want to teach other players like around yeah and sometimes they'll have like specifically this is more battle cruisery this is a newer player room this is more competitive so you can even tailor that experience a little bit more now it's still a coin flip a lot of times um and you just have to sort of experience it, I guess. But it's still the internet. Yeah, typically there will be mods and people around that want to help, same as an LGS store owner that wants to help you. Okay, so that was finding a playgroup, but there's, a, there's kind of two ways to go with playgroups, right? You can find one that exists or people that already play, or you can build one from scratch. And they will come. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, originally, spoiler alert, back in the day, there were no magic players, <laughs> right? Everybody had to learn. And True. So early on, you just had to, everybody was new and everybody was learning at once together. Yeah. And so you could build a play group. And this is something where, you know, you have, you have friends or cousins and relatives. And I'd say in general, most people who would be interested in magic, they kind of know the other people in their life that might be interested in something like magic. Yeah. Like I got into magic, got back into it literally because my nephew, I just looked at him and I was like, he would like magic. <laughs> you know what? He's just that kind of kid. He just likes those type of things. Yeah. The strategy or whatever Yeah. And that's it was, how I, yeah. I taught him to play because, you know, his dad is more into sports and things like that. And I was like, listen, your kid is just not a sports ball player and is not going to be interested in that thing. I know a thing that is more along the lines of what he probably would like. And, you know, Tom to play magic and he did like it. And, um, that's that a great a, way to start. Yeah, that's a really good way to start. Is like you just probably know a cousin or a friend or a brother or your dad or whatever that, or maybe you're looking for something to do with your brother or your dad or your mom mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, that's a it's a good way to be like, hey, this is a thing you might find fun that I'm trying to get into. Would you like to get into it with me? Yeah, or you know a group of friends that has their own group of, of board game nights, or you have your own board game night. It's just like a hey, uh, do you all want to try out magic sometime? It doesn't even be full in commander decks. It could just be like jump playing, start, yeah, jumpstart or whatever. Yeah, so there are other ways to get into magic without going full dive into commander 
Yeah, so I think sort of creating other magic players that are learning with you is not, you know, is is definitely a way you could go. Like just two people learning to play together can often be the start of a play group that you'd be surprised. Then you bring or a another podcast person in or another one. Yep. Um, <laughs> if your school doesn't have like a gaming club or a magic the gathering club, you could always start one. Yeah. It's it, a it's schools really do encourage this type of thing because magic is a learning. It, it, it tricks kids into learning math right? and all that yeah math and reading comprehension is great for magic so a lot of times a teacher will be really open to helping you start a club around magic or something like that because they will see the benefit in kids learning you know this thing that maybe they don't see the benefit in kids learning league of legends or something like that right <laughs> so, and it keeps them off the streets you yeah know? it's your social interaction there's math involved there's reading comprehension you're learning a lot of things you wouldn't like uh uh, a sports environment or something learning to deal with losses and, yeah. and victory and and like there's a lot to be taught so i would say that you know forming up a club a magic club at your school or something like that is something that and adults will probably help you with if you just express the interest in it yeah and maybe a teacher is someone that played in the past as well um but yeah great way to and oftentimes a lot of schools will get free cards from the ymca or from wizards even from school yep. programs and so they can even start sort of with that yep all right. The last piece of advice we wanted to give about this whole thing is don't get discouraged. No, do not. Yeah. It's very, very easy to get discouraged. We just talked about a whole host of complex interactions from the social side to the strategy to the deck building. There's all these different factors that go into playing and, and starting playing magic that I think it's very easy to just be like, you know what? It's too much. I don't want to do this. I'd rather just watch. But if you really do have that itch and you really want to play, I'd say just have a little patience and do not get discouraged because there will be a lot of obstacles and hurdles along the way. Yeah, the outcome's worth it though. Once you sort of, you know, you have to invest some amount of time, effort, everything else, but it's definitely worth it. You make lifelong friends. You have a great time. Mm -hmm. This is a game that you can play for years and years and years too. So yeah, you could, you could play your decks 20 years from now and still have just as much fun. Yeah. It's definitely obviously a big part of our lives. And you know, I think if you're thinking of getting into it, it's something that can definitely enhance your life in a lot of ways. So, you know, like we said, with uh, social interactions, sometimes, you know, things can happen and you might have a s slight bad experience. P don't let yeah. that like stop you from continuing and following through. Yeah. You know, Josh and I have had our fair share of many, 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 many bad games, bad experiences. Um, but it's important to sort of truck through it. You know, you want to push through those so that you can get to the awesome event or the thing that makes you so happy that you went to. I think for a lot of people, like the encapsulation of why magic is great happens at like a Grand Prix or a Magic mm -hmm. Fest where they're like, wow, I finally met all these people I've been talking to online. I got to play with all these new people and learn so many new things. This is truly the greatest game ever. But they had to go through some hardship to get there in the first place. Yeah. I mean, I, I just love the even the nights when it's just like our staff and, you know, there's 15 of us or so and we just play commander for a couple hours we're just like hey anybody who wants to we're gonna order pizza and yeah this thursday if you want to stick around and play after work we're gonna be here playing or a lunch break or whatever it is yeah and those are some of the just best nights right there's not it's not complicated in any way but we had to work pretty hard everybody to get there right they had to go through all the hurdles mm -hmm. that we just talked about today uh, but the roi as they would say is you know 20x so pretty good yeah pretty Can't good. any vc would like that that was a lot of uh <laughs> what is that called uh uh, uh investor talk yeah sure. tech talk whatever <laughs> there you go <laughs> All right, to the listeners, if you could go back in time and uh, change history, no, just kidding, talk to your younger self. I'd save JFK. I don't yeah. know. Kill <laughs> Hitler. Grassy Knoll. Grassy Knoll. Uh, 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 and you could talk to your younger self, even if it was yesterday, even if it was two weeks ago, what would you tell them in terms of getting started in Commander to, to sort of help them on their journey? Or, you know, if you could go back and say, you know what, I'd rather do a play group rather than make that, you know, what are those tips that you would give? I'm sure there's going to be so many awesome comments. Uh, this is definitely a comment section that I will be on the lookout for because I think it's a really valuable thing because everyone's experience is very subjective and their own. So I don't know. I've never lived another second in someone else's shoes. So that's why we love asking the listeners these questions. All right. And if you are getting started into Commander as a format, channelfireball.com slash command is the place to go to find your pre-cons. Mm -hmm. The singles you're going to buy, colorless cards or staples early on. Trust me. <laughs> uh, oh, no, yeah. When you use that affiliate link, you really are supporting our content. You're supporting things like game nights, extra turns, and you're getting great prices and great service because the Channel Fireball Marketplace really is a great place to go to get all of your magic products, singles, anything at all. Yeah. And you can just enter promo code command at checkout as well. Oh, yeah. If you forget the, the URL. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
And of course, now that you've got your cards, you want to sleeve them up in Ultra Pro sleeves because you want to theme it out. You want to have that amazing dog theme deck and you're going to have this dog theme play mat and your dog theme sleeves and everything. And Ultra Pro is the one that's going to get you there. So make sure you hit it up and uh, check out all the products they have to offer. They have cool dice. They've got deck boxes, sleeves, you name it when it comes to decking out even your game room. Maybe you want a cool wall scroll. Oh, yeah. Check it out. There's tons of amazing art, especially now that Magic's releasing. Jeez five times as much art as they used to, there's gonna be something in there that matches your taste and makes you feel that much cooler. All right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Okay, last time we right. debated Batman right. rankings. What are your Superman rankings? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We can start with, I guess, actors and then maybe talking about movies. There's a <laughs> lot of Superman movies, by the way. And there's a lot of actors. Yeah, plenty of so actors. So Christopher Reeves. He's the classic that a lot of people love. Um, well, okay, but then there's Henry Cavill, and there's Brandon Ruth, and there's, yep. Here, I there's can look the up TV a people, too. This is where I, it starts, I get to get a little lost, because there's like there's 20 so different many TV, TV ones. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if people ever watched Smallville. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. a big fan of Smallville back in the day What's as well. What's the guy's name from Smallville? I forgot. Uh, I didn't work on, you know, the DVD releases of that <laughs> show, but I, I forget. Let me type it in real quick, <laughs> actor Superman. Huh! <clears throat> his name was uh 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 nick wait why is nicholas wait nicholas cage played superman no he maybe was in superman okay 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 this list is okay, There's okay. dean kane i remember yeah that was yeah yeah, yeah. and clark for me christopher reeve is definitely at the top he is my my favorite um just because when i was growing up and watching it he had that iconic i think he was the one that really oh, the perfected hair curl. the hair curl yeah, yeah that's true <laughs> okay um, i put henry cavill number two He's a very good Superman. Yeah. I think we're actually really lucky to have a really good Superman that has been able to embody it so well for so long as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then after that, I, I, I don't know. Kind of drops down. I didn't really love Brandon Ruth's performance. Oh, Tom Welling was the Smallville. Tom Welling, he's yeah, the Smallville yeah, he's guy. Yeah, yeah I watched a lot of Smallville, so I, I'd actually put him up there too. Somebody save me. What do you think is your favorite Superman movie? I'm going to go out there and say this. None of them. I really don't like any of the Superman movies. <laughs> They're all I just think like he's ah. just kind of a tough character to tell a really compelling story around because he's invincible. Yeah, he's too powerful, and so you're always just down to Kryptonite. Yeah, the problem yeah, yeah, with yeah. Kryptonite is that the the way Superman always beats Kryptonite is the same. He just tries harder, <laughs> and the try harder method Truly. of like c overcoming an obstacle is like not super compelling. So yeah, yeah. I think the Hulk is another superhero that's very hard to make oh, compelling yeah. because. It's hard to have a superhero that doesn't want to be the superhero part of himself. Yeah, and when it turns into that, it's not like he's saying they're delivering a beautiful soliloquy. It's just, I'm Hulk. The, ah! be the best Hulk <laughs> is the Hulk from like Thor Ragnarok when he's kind of like a side character like and Hulk. he's aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. maybe War uh, Hulk hulk planet or what that what's the next one? Oh yeah 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 planet hulk planet hulk maybe yeah. that'll be interesting i'm not super familiar with the comics because he, the smart hulk is more interesting to me than the you know I, you wouldn't like me when i'm angry hulk that's right. just like basically uh bruce banner or david banner is running around the whole time like not wanting to be the cool thing that you paid money to go to the movie to watch yeah, he's literally trying to hide yeah. and not be hulk yeah, and you're like <laughs> wait no no i you... <laughs> paid money to watch the hulk crush stuff stop trying to to not, stop, to not be it. the yeah, Hulk, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I think also we want to mention Henry Cavill because maybe he plays magic. Henry, if you want to play on game nights or anything. Anytime. Anytime. You just let us know. Um, you could fly here. We'll, uh, you could fly here. <laughs> I was going to say, we'll fly you here, but I get it. Super. Yeah, yeah he can can. fly. Yeah, yeah. 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 You'll, you'll figure it out. Uh, but you're, maybe you're in LA too, but just let us know. Let us okay. Know. Okay. All right. That was, a, that was a silly end step. But I think we all, I like it, it. it's a little bit easier than Batman, I think, because there just as, haven't, haven't been as many iterations of There's, Superman. I think. You know, um, somebody out there who played Superman is like, listens to our show and is like so mad right now. Yeah. They didn't mention Gerard Christopher from 1989 to 1991. He's just, just mad pissed. <laughs> He's just been so upset. <laughs> I don't even know who that is. Sorry. So yeah. dude. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone Arthur Meadowcroft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Grov Gladi, Truck Tide, Jimmy Block, Damon Lynch, Shauna Gillis, Mitch Trafford, and Evan Limberger. And of course, big thanks to Jeffrey Palmer, who often does the living card animations behind us on set, but also the animations that start our show at youtube.com slash the Command Zone Podcast. You can find Jeffrey on Twitter at Living Cards MTG. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we will see you next time. Good luck on your commander journey. And have fun. Peace. Peace. Thank you for your attention. 
For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>